All right. Hi, guys. My name is Kraken. I will be your host today. So, um, in support of Pride Month, we decided to uh, interview a couple of really cool scientists um, who are in the LGBTQ plus community and see what their experiences are as being LGBT in the STEM community. Um, what advice they have to younger generations, as well as where they see uh, visibility being LGBT in the STEM community, um, how we can improve that for our younger generations. And so with me today is Dr. Jimmy Bernot. Uh, I hope that I'm saying your last name right. Uh, he is an evolutionary biologist and an NSF postdoc research fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. His research interests include crustacean phylogenetic, phylogenetics, copepod taxonomy, and systematics, parasite evolution, and computational biology. He is working to resolve the crustacean tree of life and understand the processes that have resulted in the spectacular morphological diversity of modern crustaceans with a particular focus on parasitic copepods. Uh, so hi, Jimmy. Uh, I think you might be muted. Jimmy, are you okay? Please bear with us. Um... Um, just to check, is my mic clear? Is there any strange uh, electronic noises? Hello? Is this better? Hey everybody, we're just working out some technical difficulties, so bear with us for a minute.
Hello? Is this clear? Yeah, sounds great. It might have been my Air AirPods acting up or something. Okay, uh, that's all right. Well, now uh, I hope... Uh, let's get back. So, uh, hi, Jimmy. Uh, how are you doing? Hi, and hi, everybody. I'm, I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about what you do and what got you into your field? Sure. Um, and everybody, thanks uh, for being here. It's a, it's a real um, honor and pleasure to talk with everybody. So yeah, my name is Jimmy Bernat. I use he, him pronouns. And um, I'm an NSF postdoc fellow, and I'm working at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. right now. And I've been working here since uh, January, so I'm relatively new. Um, and as far as my research, I focus on uh, crustacean evolution, especially parasitic crustaceans. So kind of how uh, organisms that evolve parasitism, how that like initial transition occurs from a free living animal to a parasite to a parasite. And I specialize on a group of small shrimp like crustaceans called copepods. Um, they're about the size and shape of a sesame seed. If you've ever watched SpongeBob SquarePants, plankton was clearly modified, uh, you know, modeled after a copepod. They're small, have a single kind of cyclops eye. And a lot of them are planktonic, but about half of them are parasites. Um, and I got started in my field as an undergraduate a biology major at the University of Connecticut. I was thinking about careers in biology. I knew that that was my favorite subject for a while. Um, and so I had heard about these careers and like research, and I'm putting that in air quotes because at the time I really had no idea what a career in research entailed. Um, but I talked to some TAs of mine and then met with a few professors um, who I thought their research sounded interesting. And basically the person I, the professor I met with was, uh, her name's Janine Kyra, and she studies tapeworms that live in sharks and stingrays. And she was by far the most passionate about her research and what was going on in her lab of all of the people I talked to. And so I thought tapeworms are kind of weird, but sharks are pretty cool. So I figured I would try it for a semester. And then I ended up working with her for um, like five years as an undergraduate and a master's student before um, I moved to DC to do my PhD. And now I'm doing a postdoc in DC as well. So how did you get into like working at the Smithsonian? I'm, uh, I'm assuming that that's your postdoc. Yeah, uh, I actually started um, kind of volunteering or uh, uh, being what was called like a, a research uh, a fellow or a research associate at the Smithsonian um, as soon as I started my PhD. And I, and I kept that appointment all throughout my PhD, which kind of sounds maybe fancy, but it, it just meant that I had um, a sponsor, a, a curator at the museum that I was working with. The curator I worked with, her name is Anna Phillips, um, and she's uh, a specialist on parasites and especially leeches. And I've known Anna for a while because she did a postdoc when I was um, uh, at the same lab at the University of Connecticut when I was doing my master's. So when I, uh, a big part of me wanting to do my PhD in DC at George Washington University was that the Smithsonian was close by and I knew there was, you know, there's a lot of amazing scientists working there. So I um, pretty much just talked with Anna and said, hey, could I have access to the Smithsonian? Can I be like, uh, you know, she had some equipment in her lab, like powerful microscopes that I wanted to use that uh, my advisor at GW didn't have. So she said, sure. And um, so that gave me access to like the behind the scenes labs at the museum. And I also started doing a lot of outreach at the museum. So I would bring like cool jars of sea creatures into the ocean hall. If anybody's been there, I would usually set up right underneath one of the whales and talk to visitors about um, 
the collection at the Smithsonian and some of the crustaceans that I thought were really interesting. Uh, so I did that throughout my PhD. I would be doing that now in my postdoc, but the museum only just reopened last week. Um, so instead, for about the last year or two, I've been doing a lot of uh, like science engagement work on uh, social media, mostly Twitter, but I'm also on Instagram and TikTok. Um, and I'm usually talking about any interesting thing I come along, a lot about copepods, crustaceans, and uh, parasites. So if anybody's interested, yeah, you could follow me on any of those channels at Jimmy Bernat. Um, yeah. And so I know that I follow you on Twitter and uh, you're very, you're open about being a part of the LGBT community. Um, and so in terms of like your career, did you have any role models while growing up? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so I identify as a gay man. Um, and I didn't really have any LGBTQ role models growing up. Um, trying to think back i had uh i was part of like an early kind of um like diversity and inclusion group in high school um and you know my uh friend frank who was out at the time was part of that group as well so i had some exposure to like the lgbtq community but at that time i didn't really know i didn't see myself as part of it and i wasn't really aware that i was gay um, but later in life, I did have, uh, some role models. So as I started coming out, um, really when I was in graduate school at the university of Connecticut, um, so in my early twenties, um, I, there were two gay male professors, uh, in the ecology and evolutionary department at the university of Connecticut. So, um, before I left the university, I kind of worked up my courage to ask each of them for like separate meetings, just because I had some questions about kind of being gay in science and whether or not I should be kind of open about that and PhD interviews or potential postdoc interviews or so on. Um, and so talking with both of them was was very helpful. So uh, one of them was a botany professor, Ken Holsinger, and the other is a, a professor that studies, um, is an ornithologist named Morgan Tingley, who's now at UCLA. So they both gave me, were very supportive and gave me some um, helpful advice. So that was a big help uh, a bit later in my career. So related to that, like a lot of our LGBT members um, have concerns and reservations about being out in a professional setting. Um, so how is that or has it affected your professional life? Like you mentioned interviews um, and like maybe even job prospects. How has it uh, affected you? Yeah, good question. Um, I will say I had much a much smaller effect than I thought it would. Um, I remember being pretty nervous, like having, you know, basically my sexuality known to my coworkers and it just felt awkward to me. Um, you know, like straight people never have to come out as straight. And so it, it, I wasn't really sure how to navigate that at first. And I remembered being like pretty nervous telling even another gay graduate student in the department that I was gay. Um, but it just got, that all just got easier over time. Um, and I, you know, as I met other LGBTQ grad students at conferences or, um, anywhere else, I started asking them for advice. And so their advice was really helpful. Like, uh, one lesbian woman that I talked to told me she was the postdoc at the time I was a first year PhD student. And she told me that she outs herself pretty quickly anywhere she goes. And I was kind of like, why? And she was like, because I want to know if they're going to accept me for who I am. And if there's going to be any problem about that, then I don't want to work in that department or at that university. Um, so I thought that that was pretty prescient and a, a, a you know, one reason why you might want to kind of identify yourself a bit earlier on, because it's probably better to know early, uh, maybe before you join that department or that lab or something, if that's going to be a source of contention. Um, some other advice? Yeah, I mean, 
by the time I started my PhD, I was pretty comfort. I was much more comfortable being out. And so I kind of just let it happen gradually. I didn't make a point of identifying like very early on. But if somebody was talking to me and I would say something about going on a date and they would say like, what's her name? I would be like, well, his name is, you know, and so people kind of found out that way. Um, and it didn't have a huge impact. I don't think it, it that might be different for people elsewhere, but Washington DC has a big uh, LGBTQ population and is pretty gay friendly. So, um, that was a bit easier for me, but I do think it would impact maybe where I would consider taking potential jobs. I would be maybe a little bit more hesitant about taking a job in, I don't know, like Mississippi or Alabama, for instance, if I thought I would feel less, uh, less comfortable there. Of course, that could be very different at a particular university or maybe a, in a particular department could be very accepting, but I would might have some more, I would probably have some more hesitation about um, you know, potentially working in, in like the deep South. So if I'm understanding correctly, you didn't really come out until, uh, you were in graduate school. That's yeah, that's correct. And so up until that point, um, did you really know that you're gay or cause my coming, I didn't realize that I was by until I was well out of college. Yeah, I was very kind of oblivious, I guess, to my um, sexuality. I remember in high school seeing my like male friends start like paying attention to girls, and um, and so I kind of just mimicked it. And I sort of figured that that's what everybody was doing, even though so even though I didn't really have uh, like a sexual attraction, I like mimicked my male friends, um, and. I think I pretty much continued that through through college, but never really felt um, very, I don't know, comfortable, I guess. I felt uncomfortable, for lack of a better word, and I never really understood. It took me a while to understand why. Um, and yeah, but I guess I kind of gradually came to terms with that and eventually told like my best friend and I was pretty concerned about doing that because it was a guy I grew up with and I thought maybe he would feel uncomfortable or wouldn't you know we wouldn't joke around or tease each other the same way that a lot of guys do but he really took it in stride and so that made it a lot easier for me to kind of come out to to other people and so like what would you tell like a teen that you know once who might be part of the LGBT community or um, is maybe not yet out, who wants to be a scientist who is out? Yeah, well, first I would just say that science needs everyone. Um, I think, you know, uh, yeah, diversity of viewpoint, of thoughts, of background is so important for science because it means each person um, approaches uh, questions or curiosities um, differently. And that's kind of what science is all about, um, how you approach questions and, and look for answers. Um, so I think you can find uh, a home, anybody can find a home in science, I think. Um, and I would encourage people, yeah, to, to not be daunted, um, you know, just yeah to take risks take some chances be courageous um try not to be afraid uh and get back up after any failures um and yeah i think your uh, my viewpoint certainly has changed over my life and my comfort level with outing myself has increased so i don't think you need to force yourself to to do anything, you can take everything in your own time. Um, but I do think there are some advantages to um, coming out uh, at some point because uh, just like that woman I spoke with said, it, it's. I think it's a good idea to know if if you're going to be in, uh, if the environment you're in is going to be accepting of you, or if it's not going to be so accepting of you, then I would look for, a, you know, a graduate program or a, a job somewhere else. 
Uh, and so my next question is a little bit related to this. So I am uh, I go to graduate school in the Deep South. And so I personally don't know very many faculty um, who are out. And so what do you think representation is like in academia? Or um, I'm not sure if you consider the Smithsonian to be academia, but like in the research realm. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I think I do consider the Smithsonian to be academia, even though it's it's not maybe formally part of the academy because it doesn't like grant degrees. It is, um, you know, a academic research at the very least. And uh, there's a lot of collaboration with gra graduate students and professors. Um, yeah, so, well, I've... Uh, I've kind of learned through the grapevine that there's definitely a long history of gay scientists at the Smithsonian, but they were just more closeted up through like the eighties. Um, but I do think that academia in general tends to be more liberal and more progressive. So I'm not saying everything's perfect, but I do think you can find um, uh, that it tends to be pretty accepting of people from different backgrounds, especially members of the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, one thing about being LGBTQ is that it's kind of like this hidden element of diversity that people don't just like see it at first. So in some ways that maybe makes it a little bit easier for us. Uh, you know, we're not identified right away by the color of our skin or something, but um, uh, yeah, so I guess I'm, I, I haven't found that it has made a huge difference in the academic communities that I've been a part of. I, I will, I was just thinking about something though that you asked in the last question that I'll come back to, that I thought I'd come back to about like, how did I come out and what was it like for me and what would I say to young people? I'll be honest about this. Um, I actually had a very pessimistic view um, when I was first coming out. And I think this is good to talk about because my view has changed so much. But when I realized I was gay in graduate school, I, you know, I was at the University of Connecticut, large, pretty progressive institution, but in a very rural area. So there was not like a gay bar or much like LGBTQ community that I could find. There were undergraduate communities, but I was a graduate student at that point. So I felt like I didn't really fit into those. So I never really pursued that. Um, and I was kind of pessimistic and I basically thought I would probably be alone forever. Um, and looking back on it, I kind of, uh, I feel sad for myself or I have a bit of pity for myself. Cause I remember just thinking, oh, it's hard for straight people to find a mate, you know, a, a partner and they have like half of the population open to them. So what are my chances of ever finding somebody that I fit with? Probably really low. So I sort of gave up before I even got started. And that did make me um, lonely for a few years. I really, I really like dug into my work a lot. Um, and so in some ways, maybe that was that was good for me professionally, but I don't think it was good for me, like, psychologically. I didn't have any major issues or anything. I don't think I was depressed, but I was sad. And I basically just accepted so early on, before I'd ever even dated somebody, I accepted that maybe I would never date somebody. Um, and then I moved to Washington, D.C., much more kind of progressive environment and... Like within a few months, I met a gay guy at a farmer's market and we went out a few times and I was like, oh, that didn't end up lasting. But it it felt very easy and natural. And I, you know, then I started kind of coming out of my shell a little bit and kind of, you know, getting into the dating world and ended up, um, you know, finding a, a partner that I was with for a few years. And um, yeah, so I think it gets much easier and don't. Uh, I guess don't give up before you get started or just don't give up at all. There's, you know, more to come in the future. So in terms of like dating um, in STEM, uh, do you deliberately look for other people like other men who are in STEM or is it? 
You know, good question. I I haven't looked for that in particular. Um, I think there's just other things that are more important to me um, relationship-wise. Um, so I haven't specifically tried to, like, uh, narrow my search, I guess, that much to be like, oh, another person in, in another gay man in STEM, for instance. But I will say I'm... You know, I know that I'm attracted to people that are um, very determined and highly motivated in their own careers, whatever that is. Um, I feel like I am that way in my career, and I, I'm just attracted to that in another person. I also think that that helps me feel more comfortable because I know that I make, you know... A, some compromises for my, in terms of my like work life balance. And I feel like another sort of highly motivated person that is kind of also career focused to some degree um, will understand, you know, seeing that in me. Um, so I've looked for those sorts of like traits, but not necessarily a STEM background. And both of the, I've been in like three, I guess I would say serious relationships. The first one was with somebody who was a postdoc um, at a different university and com- in like computer science. So that, that was a person in STEM. But the other two people that I've dated for l- longer time periods have, have not been um, in STEM or at least not in the sciences. So uh, related to, kind of related to that, like how do you... Uh, with your relationship with the postdoc, how do you, two people who are so busy find time to date each other? Um, yeah, good question. Um, and I don't think that's specific to STEM, actually, because um, when I broke up with my uh, previous boyfriend like two years ago, um, I started to kind of date around a little bit. And there was one guy that I really liked in a very different career, more in um, kind of like uh, media covering politics and race issues in the US. Um, And, uh, but I feel like there's, Finding that work-life balance is hard in very in many careers. I think not specific just to science, and I've seen that in a in a bunch of other people. And you know, I think for for me, sometimes that lack of availability or when somebody doesn't make time, um, uh, I found that to be yeah, hard. And I realized like, okay, this might not be somebody that I would date. Like I'm, I'm very busy, but I'm making time. Um, and I understand that other people are busy, but, um, yeah, I think when it's, I, I don't ask for a huge amount of time, uh, commitment, but I do really value quality time. And so I really appreciated my current partner when we started dating. I knew he was super busy, has a lot going on in his life, but always made himself very available. Like if I ever texted him and was like, hey, do you want to do something tonight? Watch a movie or whatever, get dinner. Um, I felt like he made himself really available. And that was something that really um, attracted me to him. I think that's a really great answer. I really like that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I actually have a question from the audience that I think is quite related. Uh, Well, not necessarily in terms of like dating, but like, um, has there been any time where you think being part of the LGBTQ plus community benefited you as a scientist? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Well, I think in some indirect ways, certainly, I think members of the LGBTQ community tend to be, um, what's the word for it? I think we tend to have more of like an awareness about ourselves and people that we're talking to. And maybe that's because 
Um, we've had to build that up either to fit in in certain situations or to be uh, aware of somebody that we might be like a little fearful of. Um, so I think, yeah, in my experience, members of the LGBTQ community tend to be um, like socially pretty smooth or at least very in tune with and able to read other people very well. And so I think those skills help in any career. Um, and so there's some of these like indirect skills like that, that I do think are helpful for all sorts of careers. Um, in terms of more specifically, um, you know, I suppose I have opportunities like this that I wouldn't have if I was a straight man. And so because I'm interested in um, science outreach and science engagement, I do think being a member of the LGBTQ community has opened some more doors for me, for instance, like this opportunity in particular, um, and other sorts of panels like this that I've been a part of. Um, and I, I guess it, it remains to be seen if that will be um, something that hurts or helps me in, in job interviews. I suspect it will be something that helps me um, because I am, uh, you know, I, I think an institution that is um, working to be more inclusive uh, sees value in having members of the LGBTQ community associated with them, especially if they're active members in that community. Um, you know, so I think, for instance, if you say you are applying to grad school or a postdoc, I don't think, you know, necessarily being gay alone gets you many bonus points. But if you say, like, I'm gay and I'm active in, or I'm a member of the LGBTQ community and I'm active in the organizations or I've mentored um, gay youth or blah, blah, you know, if there's those, if there's elements like that of how you've, you know, integrated and worked with that community, I do think that is seen as a strength at many institutions, how you're kind of then contributing to inclusivity. Uh, I now have a question, like how has, so while in graduate school, um, how did coming out affect your relationships with like your peers and your cohorts, like your PI? Yeah. Um, again, not very much. Like I thought it would have a much bigger effect than it did, but at least at the university of Connecticut and at George Washington university, I felt like nobody really cared. Like it was no big thing. Um, I remembered being nervous coming out to people in the department at the University of Connecticut and everybody really just took it in stride and was kind of like, whatever. <laughs> I felt like it made like it. I thought it was like this big deal. And then when I would tell people, they'd be like, no, I don't really care. And it would be sort of anticlimactic, um, which is a good thing. Uh, I do remember when I first came out, maybe to one of the first people I came out to in my PhD program at George Washington University, I was a little worried about being sort of stereotyped initially so I didn't out myself for the first like month or so and when I did I remember being approached by a woman in my cohort that was like oh that's great we could go shopping together and I was I just sort of was like oh yeah sure but in my head I was like I am not you're gonna be your shopping buddy I don't even like shopping for myself um, so I thought that was kind of funny, but like really such a minor, uh, uh, element of sort of my fear of like being stereotyped. I was like, oh, I don't want to be like the gay guy in the class or something. And it ended up being like a total non-issue. Like nobody cared whatsoever and didn't see me any differently. And there was not, I didn't feel like there was any sort of spotlight on me because of that. Um, in terms of my advisors, I actually didn't tell my master's advisor while I was working in her lab. I regret that now, but I didn't, I didn't not tell her for any reason. I wasn't like withholding that information. I just, it felt very awkward to bring up with her. I, I have a great relationship with her and I did then as well, but I feel like 
most of our conversations were more about kind of business and she was an incredible research mentor and so we focused on that there were were things that i definitely talked with her about um in my personal life but it never it always felt like it was i would have been forcing it maybe to bring it up with her so i never did and then maybe six months after i had been in graduate school i saw her at a meeting and she was asking me how I was doing. And I said, I'm doing really well. Actually, I'm dating this guy. And I, and she was like, I know, because as soon as you posted something about it on social media, meanwhile, Janine is not on any social media, but she was like, as soon as you posted something, one of the other graduate students from her lab who overlapped with me came like running into her office to be like, look at this guy that Jimmy's dating, blah, blah, blah. So I guess it was a little bit like, Nobody in that lab, I think, or I guess the gra other graduate students in the lab did. I had outed myself to them. Um, but anyway, they had kind of told my advisor when they saw that I was dating somebody. And she was so, uh, like, she was totally fine with it. And actually, when I, she was, she said something along the lines of, like, oh, I, I figured or something. So I think she had already kind of known or suspected and it just had not really come up before. It's almost a little hilarious that somebody else accidentally outed you. <laughs> they probably did not realize that you had not deliberately outed yourself to your advisor. Probably not. And it, I think they did it in a more like, in more a very like, like, oh, we're like, excited. Oh. He's like, oh, we're excited for Jimmy kind of type thing. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a similar situation where I accidentally outed somebody to their advisor uh, by accident, and I didn't realize it. <laughs> so I'm on How the other that end of over? that. Yeah. Uh, I do have another question, kind of off topic. I saw that there is a podcast that you did on the world of queer worms can you tell us a little about these hermaphroditic worms sure yeah so this was this is like it's called the podcast is called exo lore um and uh moya the, the uh is the woman that leads it and she's an astrophysicist and so she brings and she's really into like science fiction and so am i and so she invited me on an episode so basically what the podcast does is she kind of dreams up a planet right because she's an astrophysicist so she'll be like okay we're on this like rocky planet that is in the goldilocks zone so there's liquid water on it but maybe there's two suns or maybe it's tidally locked so it doesn't like rotate there's a bright side and a dark side whatever um so she'll set up sort of like the physics of the situation and then she'll bring in like a biologist to help invent kind of like the biology of the situation and um in the case of the queer world um that we talked about she also brought in like a historian and a social scientist and so we just dreamt up this world right so it's kind of like a you know 45 minute practice in in world building and she had told me ahead of time that she was interested in kind of like what would uh you know a hermaphroditic intelligent life maybe be like and so that's kind of i came in for the biology side of that and talked kind of about how like hermaphrodit hermaphrodism works across and sort of like sexual systems across animal life um, and then we kind of, I was saying that a lot of worms are hermaphroditic, so that kind of stuck. So we like ended up imagining this world of hermaphroditic, like intelligent hermaphroditic worm sort of life. And it was very interesting And in the historian would talk about how, you know, uh, for instance, like, uh, what are they, what are those called? Like royal marriages, you know, how like in the past, they're probably like diplomatic marriages, how things could change then if you were like hermaphroditic or were able to like self fertilize and how like royal families would maybe be even more inbred as a result. Anyway, it was very interesting. Um, and I've been on her podcast since. I don't think the next episode is live, but we like invent. Uh, 
imagined another sort of society, not hermaphroditic in this one. But anyway, it's just a fun podcast. If you kind of like science fiction or fantasy or just the idea of aliens, it's a good one to check out. And I'll actually link that in the chat after we're done. Uh, but I do have another question uh, from the audience, actually. So they ask, your field of research might gross some people out. Are there moments in your research when something was too gross for you? <laughs> Good question. Um, so I'm trying to think of like the grossest things I've seen or done. First, I will just say that I think, you know, just like doctors become like very comfortable with blood and trauma and things like that as a, a and I don't mean to equate these things, but like as a parasitologist, you become very comfortable like looking at animals' guts, for instance, or dissecting creatures or seeing ticks or something, you know, or dermatitis resulting from some like parasite infection. Um, so you do become like you just approach it very analytically and you lose a lot of that like grossness or squeamishness over time. Um, but things that have grossed me out. OK, number one comes to mind. I had a very I had I think it's the grossest thing I've seen as a parasitologist, but it also like ha I have this like morbid fascination with it. There's a group of parasitic flies called um stomach bots they're they're bot flies so like you know some people may be familiar with these flies that can infect other mammals and humans where they like lay a, basically an egg under the skin and like this maggot hatches in the skin and then eventually pupates and leaves as a fly well there's ones that do that internally um so in in things like camels and uh, horses and even rhinoceroses get these things so they're, they're, the fly lays eggs around their mouth and the animal swallows them and then the maggots develop in their stomach attached to the stomach lining. Um, and then when they're ready to pupate, they let go and they get pooped out and then they hatch into a fly. Uh, and we had a specimen in the parasitology lab when I was an undergraduate that was a horse's stomach, like stretched out in a giant two gallon jar with like 50 of these like maggots attached to the stomach lining. So that was probably the grossest thing I've ever seen. But it was also pretty amazing. I mean, these flies do that. And then they in the, it's the they do that and they hang out in the stomach all winter so like when the ground is cold and other flies are like not moving around these things are like chilling out in a horse intestine in a horse stomach where it's nice and warm and then in the spring they let go and they get pooped out and hatch into a fly so it's like a pretty brilliant system but i think that probably grossed me out more than anything that i've seen but it wasn't something that i was like oh gosh i have to leave the lab it was like Wow, that's gross, but also kind of cool, but gross. That is really gross. <laughs> I am... Uh, <laughs> I'm not usually squeamish, but bugs are just... Mm, no. <laughs> uh, well, we're about running out of time. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say to our audience? Um, one thing that I wanted to say was in terms of LGBTQ mentors, I didn't know this at the time, but there, like, there were other people I'd met or heard about that were LGBTQ. Um, first, it made a big difference. Some people that I did know, like the first woman I came out to in the lab I worked in was like a administrative assistant in the lab, but she always had like a rainbow sticker on the back of her chair, and I just thought that was like it was like a little safe space sticker that that was so cute and such a small gesture but made a big impact and that's one of the reasons why i put like flag in my instagram handle just to or my uh, twitter handle just to like increase visibility a bit a few years after that i found that doug fatuma who like if anybody's taken undergraduate evolution or graduate evolution class you've probably like he literally wrote the textbook on evolution and he's like an openly gay man and i had no idea until i talked to one of the gay professors at UConn and they kind of mentioned that. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Like the guy that wrote the book on evolution that everybody is gay. Um, so even though I didn't like, I think that's kind of a role model some people can look up to. Um, 
What else would I say? Yeah, uh, to people that are interested in science or any sort of career, just try it. Like I said before, be courageous. Um, try not to be afraid. And if you do fail, and you will get back up after failure. I struggled with that. I feel like I didn't fail all that much until I was in my PhD. And then I had like two big failures all around the same time. And I was pretty like crushed by them. And then I realized I had just been fortunate up to that point to not really have any big failures. Um, and so, and I did learn a, a lot from that experience. And I feel like I'm a stronger person now for figuring out how to like pick myself back up after that. Um, yeah, so I think I would leave it at that. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them. And if people want to reach out to me, feel free. It might be easiest to just be like, find me on, on Twitter. I'm pretty active there at Jimmy Bernat. Um, and feel free to like send me a direct message. Um, or you could email me my email, Jimmy Bernat at gmail.com. Um, yeah, so if uh, anybody wants to reach out, feel free. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a small little break while I go to the bathroom, and then we'll be rejoined by Vic, um, and I'll introduce him in about two minutes. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, so um, I am back, uh, and we are going to be joined with Vic. Uh, let me see if... Alright, so Vic is a third year student and PhD candidate at City of Hope in Los Angeles. I completed his bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Texas at Austin, um, and beginning lab research in their senior year of high school, Vic started out in the field of DNA repair and is now an immuno-oncology lab for their PhD. He has currently co-authored ser several papers and white papers, not only in their own field, but also addressing inclusion of non-binary genders in earth and space sciences. Vic came out as non-binary transmasculine after graduating undergrad and began transitioning during graduate school and has had to advocate for his inclusion and safety at his graduate school through arguing against transphobic policy. Uh, they are very passionate about LGBTQ+, and particularly trans and non-binary inclusion and acceptance in STEM, and is very excited to be here today. Hi, Vic. Hello. How are have you doing to today? wrangle my cat. <laughs> oh, I get you. Uh, my cat has been all over my desk. Uh, yeah, mine really likes to get into mischief and she's tall, so she can reach so many places she shouldn't. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, uh, so I have a couple of questions first. Uh, so about your PhD, it's in immunology and oncology. So what got you into this field? So this is a fun story that basically ends up with the answer of I did not intend to go into that field. I kind of stumbled into it. Um, 
So the school that I go to is a very small graduate school associated with the City of Hope Hospital. And when I went there, I was fully intending to join a lab associated with DNA repair because they have a lot of good labs there for that. However, uh, due to circumstances beyond my control and that I don't fully understand, none of the labs were actually able to take me despite me having rotated through all of them. So by the end, it was uh, all of my other peers had joined a lab. I had done five rotations and needed to join something and ended up reaching out to, um, uh, to a professor who happened to be in the immuno-oncology department, but also worked um, on vaccine development and with specifically with salmonella. And I really like working with bacteria. It's, it's what I prefer uh, in addition to cells. So uh, that's how I, he, he had space and I ended up really loving his lab. So I joined immuno-oncology basically just for that professor because of how welcoming and accepting he was. Uh, and so um, if you are allowed to talk about it, what are you currently working on for your research? I can talk about it. We actually literally just the other day submitted a paper we've been working on for a couple of years now. So this is going to be my first, first co-author publication. Um, so what uh, there are two main projects that I'm working on. This is the one that the one that's getting published currently is the one that I didn't have as much of a role in, so I can talk a lot more freely about that. Um, it involves using salmonella to infiltrate tumors. So one of the big problems with solid tumor cancers is that because they're the I mean, solids right in the name, they're extremely dense and they're really full of things like collagen and hyaluronic acid and all of these like protein matrixes that make it really, really difficult for anything therapeutic to get in because this solid uh, buildup of all of these proteins also compresses the blood vessels. So there's like no blood flow into these tumors, which is one of the main ways that therapeutic drugs can get in there. So that's why, um, especially for solid tumor cancers like uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, the, it's so, so hard to treat it. Um, in addition to pancreatic cancer having its own set of issues of barely having any symptoms, so they only diagnose it when it's almost too late. But what we do is you use salmonella to express various... Um, enzymes that will break down the protein matrices inside, uh, inside these tumors. So the salmonella that we use is really cool in that it can uh, release these, um, it secretes its own little uh, chemokines that allow it to burrow into the tumor. And so it preferentially like, likes to go into the center of these super solid tumors. So, um, they're really useful little guys. <laughs> that is so bizarre. I've never heard of using salmonella because um, I do a little bit of immunology stuff and, and I've heard of using like helminths uh, or at least helminths derived products for um, kind of modulating inflammation, but I've never heard of using salmonella for targeting cancers. Yeah, I, I hadn't really considered either. I didn't realize that they were so good at getting into these tumors because the other cool thing is that they follow the same nutrient gradient that uh, flows towards uh, that the tumors use. So you can uh, give the salmonella systemically and they will go and find the tumors because that's where they want to live because they um, salmonella also are um, they can thrive with or without oxygen. So the center of a tumor has very little oxygen because it's full of dead cells and it can thrive within the center of these tumors. And then, you know, use, express all these products we ask them to express and 
break down all of these, all this crap inside the tumors. Uh, so a question is from the audience is, how would you prevent the salmonella from infecting a cancer patient who may have a suppressed immune system? Yes, that's a very good question. So the salmonella that we use uh, in particular has been modified. So uh, it's called, it's called uh, attenuated salmonella. So it's lacking a lot of, uh, a couple of um, the genes that code for proteins that would make um, a, a person sick. So these salmonella, like they do not have, they do not make these products that would allow them to infect someone and have the salmonella go systemic. Uh, so it's actually, it's been used. Uh, I think there's been several clinical trials that involve salmonella, this particular kind. It's called salmonella typhimurium. And uh, it's been found to be really, really safe. Uh, it, there, I don't think there's been a single instance of the salmonella actually like infecting anyone and resulting in the a patient dying just from the salmonella and not from what the salmonella is expressing. Do macrophages and neutrophils still recognize them as, um, as foreign pathogens? To, um, to my knowledge, no. Um, when I've um, administered treat, when we've administered treatments, um, we're working in a mouse model at the moment. Um, they tend not to get sick from the salmonella itself. Um, and the other kind of interesting thing about it is that when you give the salmonella and it preferentially colonizes the tumor, it's not anywhere else, and the macrophages already can't really get into the tumor. So it's like they kind of go in there and they hide. Um, and uh, the salmonella that we use um, are also under an inducible operon. So they're not actually expressing anything until we tell them to. And we wait until they're in the tumor to um, tell them that they can go ahead and start expressing their enzymes. That's wild. I'm... <laughs> That's wild. That's so cool. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and I kind of love how uh, you didn't intend on going into this area, but I can also hear that you are just very passionate about it now. Yeah, you know, like they always, uh, there was this kind of mantra that older students would always tell me and about grad school in general is when you're looking for a lab, find one where you like the environment and your peers and the PI and the, they said the science will follow. Like you will most likely become passionate about what you're doing as long as you're in an environment that you feel comfortable and happy in. So there are plenty of other like, especially in the DNA repair labs that I tried out, there was one project that I was so, so passionate about. And this professor told me that he didn't have space for me in his lab. And thinking back on it, it's a good thing I didn't, like, press harder and, like, try and join his lab. Because if he didn't want me from the start, like, it wasn't going to be a good experience if I went back there. So it's, it's really important, I guess, life lessons. Um, finding a PI that you really connect with. Uh, I actually resonate very closely with that because I also found my PI kind of accidentally as well. I didn't intend to go into what I'm currently researching. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes they can just pop up in the, the strangest places and you're just like, oh, I, I didn't know that you worked here, but your stuff seems cool. And then next thing you know, you're working for them. <laughs> Uh, and so related to that, um, so uh, a question from the audience that I think is very relevant is when you started living as your intended gender, uh, do, would mm -hmm. you say that it was very difficult for you to find a place in academia as a trans person before you were able to pass? Yes. So uh, I should mention that I also have several like mental health conditions that were really, really exacerbated my first year of grad school because essentially, to, to kind of set the scene a little, um, 
my partner was still uh, in Texas at the time, as was basically my whole family. So I had just had surgery the summer before graduate school and couldn't walk properly. So I move across the country, um, starting my first year of graduate school, coming out as trans, not having any friends, not being able to walk properly, um, only having just started to drive and being away from my partner. So <laughs> it was a very, very rough first year. And I think a lot of like, I was so stressed and anxious all the time because I was not only worried about graduate school in general, I was worried about how I was going to go about transitioning, when I was going to see my partner again, if I ever was, if they were going to be able to move in with me. Um, and it just kind of made everything um, that May, may have been seen more as like a microaggression or something that I could shake off a little bit now. It just made it that much worse. Like, for example, there um, in my cohort, there were a lot of times when it turns out the boys did like a boys night and the girls did a girls night. And I never found out about either of those until after they had happened because no one knew where which one that I should be invited to. And so they just didn't invite me. That is awful. Yeah, it wasn't fun. <laughs> um, and so kind of related to that, like for our LGBT members to have concerns and reservations about being out in a professional setting, um, how has it affected you like professionally outside of these social circles? So that's a good question. So I... Um, I haven't really been, um, I haven't gone to a lot of conferences or, um, I guess, been spo uh, spoken at a lot of uh, conferences or presentations or anything, mostly because at the time that I would start to do that, COVID happens. So I just haven't had the opportunity yet. But um, at least for the future, one of the things that I would have to think about if I wanted to go to like a conference or something, or if I was pursuing any sort of uh, job afterwards is um, you kind of have to do the extra work ahead of time to make sure that the place that you want to speak at or work at is going to be inclusive thing. And that can be as simple as like when you fill out an application to speak there or to, um, to apply for a job, do they have an area for pronouns? Do they make you list your uh, quote unquote gender as it was presented on your birth certificate? So stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, I haven't had anyone at least directly say anything to me or do anything to me that to my knowledge has uh, hurt me professionally, but that's also because a lot of the labs that I didn't join, um, aside from the ones that I asked and they couldn't take me, it was because I would mention my pronouns and they just would not call me by that. And so having to continuously speak up and tell them, like, these are my pronouns, I need you to get it right. If they couldn't do that, then I couldn't be there. And I guess in a way that could have hurt my career professionally because I didn't even pursue these avenues that may have been better for me professionally because they were in the field that I already had a lot of experience in. But socially and just personally, it would have been so hard and would have been really detrimental. And so with your current, your, uh, current lab, uh, how has that um, really spoken out about how different it was from these labs that were not very accepting. So my lab is really, really small. Uh, it's basically just my PI, me, um, a postdoc, and we did have one like research associate who has since left. And I came out to them all um, about like formally uh, about two weeks after I was certain that I was going to join, but I had already told my PI like 
when I was, when I like had a little like interview with him to see if I wanted to even rotate with him, where I told him like, by the way, I'm trans. These are my pronouns. Is that a problem? Um, (laughs) Which I hate to say it that way, but that's to the, that's the point that I was at with all of these other labs. Like if I had hadn't, um, if I had asked them that outright um, before being rotating in that lab and then hearing myself be misgendered all the time, like if they had just told me flat out, oh yeah, that's a problem, then I just would have saved myself the extra like two, three, four weeks of being misgendered. But um, it, it took them a while. They, they weren't Uh, They've gotten a lot better at not misgendering me. And I think, honestly, it was because um, at some point, about like a month or two after I joined, I became um, more comfortable with using he, him pronouns in addition to they, them pronouns. And and so once I like basically put in my email signature and on like one of the presentations I had to do that he, him pronouns were okay, then my PI never screwed up again because he couldn't really, uh, he couldn't remember um, to use they, them as often, but he has never once messed up now that he uses he, him pronouns. Um, And just subtle things like with the postdoc um, that's in our lab, she, um, when she is submitting things uh, like, manuscripts on my behalf i'll get an email um that says like by the way you've been put on this you've been included as a co-author on the submission and i'll notice that um whenever she put it in she changes the title to um mx if it's available or mr if mx is not available so she at least knows enough to use a gender neutral or masculine title for me uh, for these, just for these like forms, whereas someone else um, who was not accepting or just wasn't thinking would probably have put um, a more like a feminine title instead. And I so I know that uh, you haven't been able to go to very many conferences, but do you have any tips of like how you would bring up your preferred pronouns in like a conference or professional setting where you might not know? Um, everybody as intimately as like, say your lab. Yeah. So um, at those, basically any time that I'm given a name tag um, or an op- uh, an opportunity to give, to wear a name tag for any like conference or event I'm at, I always, always, always put my pronouns on there. And that can be really, really scary, especially if you're the only one putting your pronouns on there. Uh, Cause it kind of just tells everyone Hey, look, I'm trans, which like, I hate, uh, I hate that that's the case, but, um, until, you know, more cisgender people like get on board with just like making it more the norm to like have your pronouns like on your name tag. Um, that's the way that I typically do it. And, um, even if uh, a conference has given me like a printed out name tag, I will go and find a pen or ask for one and write my pronouns on there. And, you know, if someone's talking to me and they start misgendering me, I can just, you know, point to my name tag or be like, hey, I I know you didn't mean it, but my pronouns are he and they. Um, So it it can be pretty scary, but that's probably the easiest way I found to do it with with conferences and events, just because it's kind of... um, the norm for there to be name tags in the first place. It's a little harder when there's not an opportunity to wear a name tag, like when you're all expected to just be social and know each other and that kind of stuff. And so does it help when cisgendered people uh, add their pronouns? It does for me. I know uh, there, there's some, I feel like there's some discourse currently about whether people should or shouldn't, but I always think it's a good thing because if I see, because then it also helps me not misgender other people, and it really emphasizes to everyone that you can't really ever assume someone's pronouns because gender and gender presentation don't always align. So 
uh, it, it's really helpful and it makes trans people feel less, uh, less, I guess, um, I've lost the word, um, insecure, I guess, about putting their pronouns out there. Because if everyone's doing it, then it's not going to be seen as weird and, and othering. Um, so what kind of, kind of going in a different direction, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, role models like in the LGBT community did you have growing up? Or did you have any? I had zero. So <laughs> um, I grew up in Northern California, actually, like just 20 minutes outside of San Francisco. And I didn't know what a gay person really was until high school, basically. Um, not because like, and it's not because I was like raised to be like intolerant and it's not because there weren't like gay people around me. It was just something that like in the back of my mind, I knew that it was not something I was that my parents would have wanted me to be. And therefore it was not something to be talked about ever. Cause the couple times that my parents like would mention people in the LGBTQ community, it wasn't necessarily positive. So like, I, I knew that, that there were like, you guys know, role models, famous people who were in the LGBTQ community. Um, I guess the most prominent one I knew of was Ellen DeGeneres, unfortunately. But um, it wasn't until I um, kind of realized internally that I might be part of that community that I started having to go look for people who like either were very open about it or who um, even just like kind of like celebrities that I kind of felt I got like a little bit of a gay vibe from um, Elliot Page, for example, big, big role model for me. Once I had already accepted that I was part of the LGBTQ community, there were a couple people on YouTube. Um, Hannah Hart was one of them. She was a very uh, she's a pretty popular um, lesbian YouTuber. But um, no one in science. It wasn't until, I think, undergrad that I started, just out of curiosity, Googling or looking up on Wikipedia lists of, like, famous scientists in the LGBTQ community. And it's all, a lot of it was like, oh, well, this person might have been, this person might have been. Um, but, um, you know, Alan Turing was on there and like all these people they didn't necessarily have a good life because they were lgbtq um so really what really turns my i don't want to say turn my life around but made me realize that being a queer person in stem was not like such an isolating experience was when i joined twitter because that's where i found everyone and it was a lot and I joined Twitter because of the movement 500 Queer Scientists. Um, so I do know that, uh, and I follow you on Twitter as well. Um, mm -hmm. And do you think that, well, I personally think that Twitter has really helped with the visibility of LGBT folks in STEM. Um, how do mm -hmm. you feel about it? I have a complicated relationship with Twitter in that, um, you know, when I, when I first got on it, I, I have met so many, well, met in quotation marks. Cause I, I, I think there's only been one person who I like was introduced to on Twitter that I have met in real life. Um, but everyone else, like there's been so many nice people, so many accepting people, um, that I would love to get to know better and keep in touch with more. But social media in general, it's not good for me. Like I especially, I think it was when COVID happened when I kind of everything, you know, doom scrolling is a thing. And that's just what happens with, with Twitter is that, you know, I would, I would come across some, 
very sad thing. And then, you know, people would be rightfully angry about it. And um, especially when it came to all of these um, LGBTQ scientists that I were I was following because something would happen to someone at their institution uh, because of their identity or um, any of their identities, not just LGBTQ. And I would feel this like sense of like this almost like passionate outrage on their behalf of like, I need to do something and I need to be, to be the one that fix this. And, you know, I would have the same thing happen where something would happen to me and it was really cathartic and helpful to be able to put that out on Twitter. But at the same time, I was kind of like absorbed in everyone else's struggles and was neglecting my own. So I have, I've scaled back Twitter a lot and I, I, I wish I could be on there more, but man, I just get such bad anxiety from being on there lately. <laughs> I can really relate to that. Um, I feel like, though I feel like visibility in, on Twitter might be better. Uh, it, I definitely don't see as many faculty um, in academia who are, uh, you know, openly have the pride flag or the lesbian flag or the trans flag. Um, and so how do you feel like that, um, that disparity in uh, visibility on Twitter is compared to academia? Yeah, I think, I mean, Twitter makes it pretty easy to be open because you can kind of anonymize yourself a little bit. Like, I mean, you've introduced me by my first name. My last name is not out there. My last name is not associated with my Twitter. Uh, because if I gave out my last name, everyone would know my family because uh, everyone with my last name in the United States is directly related to me because my last name is that unique. So it's pretty easy for me to like go on there and be able to talk about being queer and trans in STEM and at my institution. And I don't often mention where I go either because um, I can kind of, that way I can kind of talk about what it's like and um, share my struggles and share like even like, I guess wins I have against the administration without fear of repercussions because I have to, well, I say have to, I try and I almost limit who is following me on Twitter so that things don't get back to my institution because I had a situation actually where um, an administrator started following me on Twitter and I asked her to unfollow me and she wouldn't. So I ended up having to block her, which was awful because she was my direct boss and she would like bring up Twitter, like things I'd posted on Twitter and tell me to take them down. And I'm like, who are you to tell me what I can and can't say on my profile? So, I mean, she's since not at our institution anymore, but ever since then, it's kind of been something that I, I have to um, be a little wary of. So it's, it, Twitter is really good for that, but I feel that because Twitter is really good for that, it doesn't always reflect how many people are, like, the, the actual percentage of LGBTQ people in STEM because for every person that's like super out there online, there's another person who's deeply closeted and still in STEM because of the environment uh, that they're in, or maybe it's not safe for them to come out because like in their country, it's literally illegal. Um, so I think Twitter is really good in that you can see all of these people who are being visible, but that doesn't mean that you won't be the only queer or trans person in your PhD program like I am. <laughs> so what would you tell a teen who is who is wanting to transition but is scared of scared of it because of like um, like all the negative repercussions and uh, judgment they get in STEM? Oh, that's a good question. So I would say uh, hmm. <laughs> first things first, therapy is your best friend. Um, cause if you can find, and I know that like therapy is, is also can be very expensive 
And like, even if you're, if your school has any kind of like counseling services available for graduate students, absolutely take advantage of them because being in therapy can open the doors to transition so much easier than if you're trying to navigate everything by yourself, because they, they can give you referral letters for things and it can just make the process go much smoother because, uh, the medical establishment doesn't necessarily like to take trans people at their word that they are trans and they kind of want an outside party to validate them before they will start allowing them to transition. But um, yeah, so therapy is your friends. It'll help get the ball rolling. Um, if you can find one or two people uh, in your program, whether that's like faculty members or staff members or just or your peers to talk to about it, it can make the process much easier because if you have someone who can advocate for you, then, you know, when you're not there, that person can be the one correcting people on your pronouns. That person can be the one saying, no, this person uses this name now. We don't call them by uh, their dead name. Um and um, hmm, let's see what else. Sometimes, um, like I actually chose my graduate school because I knew I wanted to transition when I got there. So I chose it because it was in an area that I deemed to be more accepting because I'm in Los Angeles right now, which as a whole is a very decent city for an LGBTQ person to live in. Like, I don't think I've ever gotten any like discrimination while here like directly whereas you know in texas which is the other place that i was considering going for my phd my partner happened to have their car parked in the city that i was planning on going that that i would have gone to grad school in and their car was keyed because they had uh, a queer sticker on the back of it so that's something i take into account and also when i um was going on interviews. I was using, like asking people how the environment was and how the insurance was with, um, with the graduate program uh, that would allow me to transition. So it involved a lot of thought ahead of time, but that's not to say that wherever you are, it'll be impossible for you to transition if you're in grad school. Uh so I'm not sure what your future career goals are, but do you think this process would be different when you're transitioning into um, like into industry rather than like staying in academia? Yeah. So, um, well, do you mean the like the transition process or do you or whether um, I'm thinking more of going into industry or academia based on me being LGBTQ? The latter. OK. Um, Yes, it's something that I've thought of. Uh, my career plans are a bit tenuous at the moment, but I actually really want to go into like being uh, someone who reviews people's manuscripts and grants. Um, I really like scientific writing. Um, but that being said, um, I tend to want to steer away from academia because of not just their general issues with the LGBTQ community and acceptance and inclusion, but also with regards to um, acceptance of mental health and um, the kind of mentality of, you know, if, if you're not suffering, you're not working, like, you're not working hard enough. And like you, grad school should be terrible and difficult and awful for you. And academia is going to break you and that's just how it is like that that kind of mentality is more what's steering me towards like an industry position rather than the fact that academia isn't as uh, inclusive of lgbtq people as i would like now industry is a whole other can of worms because i would have to do a ton of research into that company to see what their policies are because even if, you know, on the surface, they're like, yay, it's Pride Month and we're so happy to have all of our LGBTQ employees, like you have to look at their policies and see if they're actually practicing what they preach. So I think with, um, with industry, I feel like it could almost be a little bit simpler to navigate uh, because 
in industry, like you're an employee full stop. Whereas in an acad- uh, academic environment, especially with graduate students and postdocs, they almost kind of toe the line between treating you like a student when it's convenient and then treating you like an employee when it's convenient. So it's kind of like you have to navigate two different sets of policies based on whether that on that current day, at that current time, you're being considered as a student or an employee. So that kind of opens up a question, another thought that I have. So as a student, before uh, you decided to transition, how is that like as um, a person in LGBT, as a STEM student? Um, like, what's your thought process between knowing you wanted to transition and waiting to do that transition? So a lot of that had to do with... Um, the fact that I was living at home. Um, and then the other half had to do with, um, it, it, was, it was honestly more of a, um, the people that I knew um, that I was interacting with had known me by my dead name for years, ever since I had ever met them. And this included the lab that I started doing research in in high school. It, it took me until like, two years after I left to even come out to any of those people um, in research back home uh, because uh, I figured that, you know, by going to grad school um, where I knew I was going to be moving away, um, living on my, uh, living by myself, um, it would be easier um, for both myself and for the people in my program, if I just introduced myself by the name that I wanted to use. So if they didn't know me by any other name, I thought it would be easier and thought it maybe I wouldn't have to like correct people as much on my name, which was mostly true. There were still a handful of times where like, my name, my dead name would pop up in records and people would call me by that. Uh, there was a really weird scenario where a student asked me what my name was and I gave it. And then she looked at my badge and wrote down my dead name. Uh, so I had to get my badge changed, uh, my ID badge changed really quickly after that. Um, but yeah, mostly my thought process was, um, you know, I'm, I'm about to leave anyway because I only really figured out that I was trans um, kind of during my last semester of undergrad. And then I had a semester in between uh, finishing undergrad and starting grad school. And it was during that time when I was away from school that I kind of like allowed myself to explore that more often because, you know, before I was just trying to graduate and now I had the time to really like think about all this. And I just, I just thought it would be easier to, transition like both like transition into a new environment by just presenting myself how I wanted to be called for the rest of my life basically so uh in terms of like the rest of your life um oh I actually have a good question from the audience uh how can Mm -hmm. cis allies help make trans people feel more at ease in new environments So I would say first thing is, you know, um, it it could be, it can seem a little awkward, but if, you know, you're meeting, um, like, let's say students in your fellow students in your cohort for the first time, just introduce yourself with your name and pronouns or like say, oh, what pronouns do you use? And it can be a little weird, especially if like the other person you're talking to is like a cis person who, you know, is not very lgbtq friendly and it's like why would you ask me that of course i use like xyz pronouns like that's super weird but it it really does help the you know the one trans person that may be in the room uh to know that they can introduce themselves with their pronouns and that it's going to be respected because it's one thing to introduce yourself with your pronouns it's another thing to have to continuously assert that these are my pronouns, this is my name, and this is what you should call me. Like it and it's disrespectful not to. So if 
you're a cis person and you're in a group with a lot of other cis people or maybe a lot of cis people and like the one trans person in your program and someone misgenders the trans person it's much much easier for a cis person to be like hey like and correct rather than the trans person to have to keep speaking up for themselves because you know i mean i have anxiety so like that makes it all the more difficult but it's so much nicer if you know you have someone who you know is going to stand up for you so you don't have to keep doing it well we're that, i think that was a really good answer um before we end uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell um our audience or like what else can we do to make stem uh or even life more inclusive well, considering, you know, this is a biology discord, something that uh, gets thrown around a lot, specifically with regards to trans people, is, oh, don't you know biology? Like, everyone knows there's only two sexes. Everyone knows there's only two genders. That's just what basic biology is. And we're all biologists here. And whether you happen to know this already just from your biology classes, that's not what what those people are saying is not true uh their sex is on a spectrum gender is not the same as sex and you know if you ever want to take to task some of those like twitter trolls if you want to you can do some good damage i guess or damage control by being like hey i'm a biologist and you're wrong do you know basic biology because nothing about this is basic and nothing about this is like stuff you can just know from high school. Like we're biologists. We know that what you're saying is not true and stop using biology to justify your bigotry. Retweet. (laughs) Yeah, we've had to, we've had people come in and say exactly that. And, uh, I love our community, the BioCord community, because we're very, very quick to defend uh, our LGBT brothers and sisters and mm-hmm. non-binary siblings. Because, like, you're right. Like, biology isn't just it isn't just you know female or male. There's so much more to it. There are spectrums. I mean, there are so many fish that will transition to. I've had guppies that transition because there were only males. And so one became a female. Yep. Uh, there's, there's some great nature documentaries that will talk about like the, the uh, changing sexes. Uh, my favorite are slipper limpets. If you ever look them up where their sex is determined by which position they are in the stack of slipper limpets. Ooh. Plus, Flipper Limpet is a great name. Yes, please send. Can you please DM that? D- DM me that so that I can post it because I don't know how I would even begin to try to spell that. Absolutely, I will definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. So this was a really great uh, opportunity uh, for us to learn more. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we end? Um, I don't think so. No, I think that's it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, And thank you, everybody in the audience, for uh, coming to this interview. Uh, I also want to remind everybody that we are um, planning a big summer conference, which has a lot of biologists and people related to biology who will be presenting, like Dr. Randy Sheckman, who is a 2013 Nobel laureate um, in medicine or physiology, as well as a lot of other very prominent figures in science and science communication. And so I encourage everybody to sign up at bcnconference.org. And thank you so much again, Vic. And thank you, Jimmy, if you're still in the audience. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Thank you. And have a wonderful weekend. You as well. Thank you, everybody.